Thank you very much, John, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, it's I, I've been I've had a connection with the, with uh, the the uh, with Chris App with members of this community of so sound artists and sound scholars for almost um, twelve years now because I first met. Um, the tribe, let's call it, um, um, uh, at a conference in uh, St. Andrews uh, in 2006, which was the Sound and Anthropology Conference. And uh, it really, it, it, was, it was a moment which um, many things began to sort of move in many new directions. For I believe for many of us who were at the conference, Kathy says so to me, but certainly for me and for the work that we were doing, in the sense that um, we'd been working actually in this place, which um, um, so this map is uh, the map of, of a place which we in our work called Bengal. And now, in, in reality, there is no place by the name of Bengal anymore. Uh, there is a West Bengal in India. There is Bangladesh, of course. And there are bits of Bengal sort of scattered in many places, in, in, um, in all the places which are contiguous with, with, um, uh, with uh, West Bengal and Bangladesh. There are also the, there's the diaspora in many many places across India, people who go to work and form their own communities and so they carry a bit of the place with them. And uh, also people who come to the UK, who go to the, to across, who grow across, go across oceans and go to all these different places, different parts of the world. Uh, so Bengal, our Bengal really, the Bengal that we as a project, the Travelling Archive, which is a project that I share with sound recorder Shukantu Mojumdar, who's also been a um, um, uh, visiting fellow here at the LCC. So the two of us, we share this project. It was kind of something that me as a singer, songwriter, and kind of researcher of music start, started at first. And then uh, Shukanto, as a sound practitioner, he joined me. And then it sort of grew, which is a project in field recording and field research. And it is also practice-led research, which kind of leads to our own practice. So it informs the practice in turn. So it's practice-led research and research-led practice on the whole. And so this was the place where we were doing all this work. But this actually, if you look at this place, then there's actually two countries and more here. So you can see Bhutan there. And I'm rubbish with the, um, oh, I don't know how to move this, guys. Anyway, you can see Bhutan up there. I'm sure you can see in the mountains there on the green bit. And here is Bangladesh. These, there are many different states. So you can read Meghalaya there. And Meghalaya is actually the little town of Shillong is where I grew up. It's a hill town. So I didn't actually grow up in um, in Bengal. I grew up in a, in a state in the northeast of, of uh, India, which is called Meghalaya. And uh, it's a hill town, and it's called Shillong. And actually, it has, it's also called the Scotland of the East. It's uh, the Welsh missionaries went there. There's the tartan there that uh, people wear. And um, you also have Welsh words in the Kasi hymns that they sing. So it's, it's in a very sort of mix of many languages and many cultures uh, within which I've, I've grown up. And Bengal as a place is also very much about that because it's been formed and it keeps forming and reforming itself um, through the journeys that people make into it and people make out of it. So it's a, it's a two-way thing that keeps happening uh, in the case of the story of Bengal. So, but there are, it's very fractured as well, this place. It's really, really fractured. 
it, it's broken up. It was, of course, formally broken up at the, in 1947 when partition of India happened and it became part of East Pakistan. Later, after about 25 years, it became uh, the independent country of Bangladesh when it sort of had its own war with the western part of Pakistan. But um, uh, it's also fractured uh, because of because because of this whole um, the the problem lies when when you were a whole and you've been broken up formally broken up into different parts, then the question of movement between the parts that doesn't cease to happen just because a wall has been or a fence has been put up between two two countries. And now we are two, two countries. It's very difficult. And therefore, the constant flow of people across borders constantly happens. And the flow of, as a result, the flow of stories and songs and um, history is a constant thing. And that keeps forming and reforming the place. So, um, uh, so yet, for us, in our work of the Travelling Archive, we kind of like to see, we still like to imagine. So Bengal is really an imagined space for us. And we try to, because we work with songs and stories and sound and sound, we once went to record at, um, in 2015, and I'll come back to the story later, but once we went to record at the border. And the border security force, they told us we were not allowed to record at the border. But we would, I was trying to kind of you know bribe the man with some sweet words. So I was trying to kind of tell him, um, uh, he, and he was very proud of the fence that has now been put up. So he said, oh, you see now nothing can go through the fence. And so even and there are some small holes, but we'll block those too. And uh, so I said, but what about birds? And he said, well, panchi to azad hai, which means birds are free. So I said, sound bhi azad hai. Sound is also free. And you can't really stop sound from flowing across the border. So why don't, we, why don't you allow us to record? You know? And then he was somehow, he said, all right. He decided not to look our way. So <laughs> we got some recordings. Um, so um, in some ways, we try to imagine this place as a place which is kind of seamlessly where, where, where sound and like the rivers because it's very much a land of rivers and like the water and like sound and like the songs and like the stories uh, as if there is a there is an uninterrupted flow we like to imagine it like that in reality it's not like that but we'll start with what we imagine the place to be and our work is largely about my connection i think with with your work is very much um, at the level where we are all thinking about listening. We're thinking not just about sound, and, but also about how to listen. In fact, as a music practitioner, what um, did, um, what did um, strike me at a certain point of my life when I actually began to think more about research is that we are so concerned with, um, with performing, with, with the practice, in the sense of performance and a sort of you know projection of the sound, creating the sound, that we don't take much time to kind of sit back and listen. And I think from around 2001 to a time when I used to live in London, um, I, and because of my circumstances, I was also very much at home and actually very much in a, in a space where I listened, I would go and get uh, music from the libraries, I'd go and get, um, and just listen, and go to concerts, go to wherever I could, and just listen. And I think I became more and more aware of the fact that the importance of listening. And I think that has slowly brought me here, taken, taken me to many places. So uh, listening is something that flows, that is a current in, in our work. Um, so listening um, and then we realize that um, um, listening is, in, in our work, we've, we've slowly began to see how listening is, there are so many ways, so many ways to listen. And these are things, of course, that I'm also learning from 
scholars here and scholars of this discipline. Um, uh, maybe things I was doing, but I was beginning to see how I could articulate what I did. So uh, actually, the 2006 conference was very interesting for me because I took a lo lot of work, very fresh. I didn't even know what I was doing. I just said, I'll talk about me moving with the song. And when I went there and when I spoke and when I heard all these other people speak and, you know, present their work, I realized, well, well, this is more or less the kind of work that we do too. You know, it's, it's similar to what we do. So um, I kind of began to see how the one-to-one -one listening, the very intense personal listening, the communal listening, the, the shared listening, all of these things became, are actually aspects of our work and how I began to, I think the, the analysis of the listening sort of slowly happened over the, over the next decade. So, and also how do we listen to silence? How do we listen to the absence of sound? How do we sound, um, uh, a, 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 how do we sound silence? So we worked on a film um, with some footage from um, the National Maritime Museum and this is footage from uh, the 1950s. And um, they were setting up a new gallery. And so they asked us to um, create a piece of work with two films. Uh, one was, one was uh, shot by uh, Basil Greenhill, who is a maritime scholar and who was also the director of um, the National Maritime Museum. And, um, uh, and he was, a, he was actually posted in what was East Pakistan, because in the 1950s it was East Pakistan. So he was posted there, and he was, because he was interested in boats, and so he actually wrote a book later, which was called The Boats and Boatmen of, of uh, East Pakistan, but now in its new editions it's called Boats and Boatmen of Bangladesh. Although he talks about the 1950s, so actually he's talking about East Pakistan. So. It's a, it, there's a lot of, you know, what name to call a place when a history, in the course of history, its, its name changes. So which name to identify it with? So there are boats, of, boats and boatmen of East Pakistan as well as boats and boatmen of Bangladesh. Uh, he, he worked with this footage and he just, he just took, brought back some footage. There was someone else who was, um, whose, whose second name, um, the the museum couldn't tell us um, his and now right now I'm also forgetting his first name so I'm really sorry but there were two films and we kind of put the footage together and we worked with our own recordings and tried to create a soundscape so these were all different kinds of boats and river uh, and rivers of um, of Bangladesh so. But how shall I make um, so? How shall I make it full screen? Sorry, can you make it full screen for me? Yeah. Oh, fantastic! Thank you. I'm 
Stop this here. Um, uh, this the this form of song, which is called uh, these are Bengal is identified by its river songs. So the Bhatiali is really uh, known as uh, it's almost seen as emblematic of Bengal. Um, although um, this is as much the Bhatiali or the uh, or this which is one form of song. Bhati is a place which in, in, the, in terms of the river where, uh, where the, the low land of the river, the low, lower um, part of the river, the, if there is a flow from the top to the bottom. So the lower, lower plains of the river is called the Bhati uh, regions. So uh, the song that comes from the Bhati region is the Bhatiali song. Bhati Ali songs are, um, I mean, if people know nothing about uh, the of, about Bengal, they they might ask you, oh, um, can you sing a Bhati Ali for us? Because Bhati Ali has also gone to Bollywood, and so and so people uh, people know about Bhati Ali's. But this is also not just Bhati Ali. This is also Bichhed Gan, which is songs of separation. And in fact, my first work was on on um, this. On which was the the first project I did was called Love, Loss, and Longing, Biroho, uh, or the the expression of uh, or the 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 state of longing while being in a state of separation, the 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 feeling of longing while being being in a state of separation. That's in the songs as expressed or interpreted in the songs of Bengal. That's what I was working on. So bichid, bichid means separation. These are really this song, but the sim. What I why the reason this sound is so much about that seamless flow, the seamlessness of this sound. The last song that you know, uh, I I um, say um, uh, a song uh, like deho tori. Dilam Chariya Guru Tumari Name. So you see how the song begins to kind of begins to flow, and it's almost like the flow of the water. Or, uh, or a song. This song is the song that we have in this film is um, sung by Ronin Rai Choudhury, uh, a, 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 a singer who moved from um, East uh, Bengal to West Bengal at the time of partition. And he features in a lot of the films of Ritik Ghatak, um, uh, the iconic filmmaker of, of Bengal. So, um, uh, or uh, and in many of his films, these river songs and his voice. So, it's if it's a question of sound, if it's a question of listening, this voice kind of lends itself to the flow of the river, as if you know. So, mm -hmm. a song like say, which is very famously sort of uh, presented, and um, it makes it's the film is almost marked by this song, the film uh, Megheda Katara, uh, uh, Snow Clapped Star. Uh, snow capped star or what yeah so, 
Mm, no, not snow capped. Uh, cloud capped star, sorry. Yeah, Megidha uh, Katara. So, um, in that, there is this song where, which asks this question Boatman, where, um, uh, where, what is your name and what name shall I call you? So, it goes um, Kandiya Kul Hulam Bhavo No Dir Pade. Actually, the metaphor of the river and the body and life being this sort of a voyage across the river of life. Uh, so um, that keeps coming back in a lot of our songs. So, and it comes back in a lot of other, other cultures, other literatures as well. So, Kandiya Kul Hulam Bhava Maji is the boatman. Maji tor nam janina, boatman. I don't know your name. Ami dak de mo kare, ami suhum shall I call? Dak de mo kare. Mon tore ke bapar kare. So, uh, such songs, um, uh, I think um, they give a sense of um, the, the seamlessness, but that's actually an illusion of sim seamlessness that we have. It's the, the obstructions are too many. Historically, so many obstructions have been created uh, that um, uh, there, is, uh, there is no way that we can actually work across borders by denying the obstructions. We actually have to acknowledge the, the presence of the obstruction in order to break it, so, or attempt to break it. And um, so um, uh, I'll take you to a place which, is, um, uh, which I was talking about where I said, where I bribed this BSF guard and said, you know, uh, bribed with ideas. <laughs> and said um, that uh, uh, sound should be allowed to flow and be recorded. So, and, and also the whole idea of even if we couldn't record with the, bod no, with the body of the machine, we could record in our bodies, I think, you know. S recording of sound uh, with memory or in our bodies is something we will do despite, you know, borders. So, um, here is a place and um, I'll first um, <laughs> I'm sorry but uh, this is a place we went to in uh, I would like to play this one please yeah this one the third one. Yeah. yeah can I stop it oh. yeah. all right thanks um, so um, this is a place we went to in 2015 uh, with two sound artists. Uh, uh, first, the traveling archive, meaning me and Shukanto. And we had two sound artists, uh, uh, Gilles Aubrey and uh, Robert Millis, who came with us. And we went to this border, which is very near the place where I grew up, uh, as I was saying, in Shillong. So this place actually borders um, uh, borders uh, a place in Bangladesh in, in the eastern frontier of Bangladesh called uh, Silhet, which uh, many of you probably know. Uh, so um, this, this is a place called Shella in, um, in, um, in the state of Meghalaya, um, uh, uh, about a four hour drive from Shillong to, um, and crossing, going through the place uh, through a place which was earlier known to have the highest rainfall. So Cherapunji uh, was this place which used to have the maximum rainfall. And so when we were growing up, it was, we would take uh, you know, visitors to this place to see. It was just so misty all the time. You know, it was so wet, this place. And its oranges were the tastiest oranges, the juiciest uh, um, that I can remember. So. Um, 
uh, then we went to Shella and then we encountered the sort of the physical presence of, of the border here. And um, what we saw was, uh, this was, at, at this point we were actually thinking of working with um, some texts. So sort of, the, how do we sound a text? So the, how do we, how do we put, how do we try to listen to a written word? So here we thought of a few books which we could kind of have as our primary material and then start to listen to them. And uh, so one of the books that we were looking at was a book by this anthropologist Delvar Hussain. And um, his, um, his book, his, it was his, his research which he had done on the limestone factory uh, in Chatuk, uh, in Silet. And the limestone prior to, uh, prior to um, partition, so the, the head office was in Calcutta. The limestone went from the northeast of India, from these places where Shella, where we went, and um, from the quarries there, and they were transported to the um, uh, to uh, by boats uh, or through a ropeway. They were transported to the cement factory in um, in Chatuk, which is on the other side of the river, uh, and. Um, that was the practice. So once the border got sort of came into uh, existence, then what? How do you deal with this problem of you know a, a factory that has it, that is actually now its its parts are kind of broken up. You know, it is the factory is also fragmented now. So the dismembered factory. How do you deal with it? So um, how do you deal with it? Well, um, you deal with the constant seamless flow of capital which it becomes global capital. So you forget what was happening locally. You have Lafarge company from somewhere, uh, you know, come and, uh, uh, you know, install a, a conveyor belt and have uh, uh, the uh, limestone taken from one part of one country and uh, cement made in another country and the profits are shared in some other country, you know. So, it's um, uh, that that is a borderless world, really, that we are uh, talking about here. So um, this is a recording from of of cement flowing um, of limestones flowing through the conveyor belt. <laughs> Um, try trying to listen to this if we if you didn't even know the story and we've actually played this recording to various people and asked what do you think this sound is without telling them where the sound came from and uh, they said various things but mostly talked about machines they said it's the sound of a machine um, it is it, it is 
in some ways it is actually nothing happens in the sound. It, it's almost, apart from the fact that people, that there's things happening <coughs> down below with vehicles going and, um, but actually at the, at, on, at the conveyor belt, it's just a continuous flow. It's just, if you were to, um, if you were to actually draw a picture of the sound, then it would be just one straight line almost, you know, just almost nothing happens. And then, um, you, if you see um, some images, now what? Uh, with these ones, I'd like to show this. No, it's <coughs> so if I just keep going, yeah. Yeah, go left. And yeah, right. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So that's the, that's the, and of course the guards came and everybody came, just like the border it was when we were there. Everybody came and said, no, you're not allowed to record here. You're not allowed to do any. You, you're just not allowed. And this is just flow. This, this runs over. Just you can see it's public. Public, you know, passage, but yet you're not supposed to do. You, you're restricted uh, from doing. Um, um, just you, ca you can't. You can't. You're not free to do what you like there. Um, so. But we still made those recordings. Um, so this was. Um, this was the kind of place where, where we went. But then, then we also found this old factory about which Delwar Hussain writes. And this, was, uh, this is now a lot of this quarrying, which, which, is a, which supposedly does not follow the rules of, you know, uh, or regulations. So um, a lot of them are being, uh, uh, th th there's a, there's a ban on them, and so a lot of qu quarrying has stopped, and there's extreme poverty in that region. Uh, so we went to this um, place where the old factory still uh, was operating. This is 2015 that I'm talking about. It was still operating, um, and um, <coughs> Yeah, I need to, I'm really sorry about this, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just need yeah, to play this now, yeah. So, okay, so this, um, this is, um, this is the, the sound of, from that factory. Again, of limestone being taken from one, one uh, part, uh, one, one uh, side of the border to another. Limestone uh, being taken from the quarries to the cement factory, from India to Bangladesh. But there's a difference in this sound. And maybe I'm just romanticizing this, but I, I guess at least you'll hear the difference for sure. You know? And then maybe my interpretation might seem like too romantic to you, but that's, that's we're allowed to have our own interpretations. <laughs>
And then if you saw this, um, Screen. Yeah, please. Yeah. And just play. Okay, so um, if um, the point is should things remain of course I've, to me it seems like there was a there's it's this sound is far more um, the the human element in in the sound um, of of the ropeway is completely absent in the sound of the conveyor belt although it's transporting the same thing so something about perhaps it's be it says something about um, uh, the process, the, the idea of development, you know, it's, it's probably a commentary on what development is and what kind of development, does de, the kind of development that we are having now, is, is it dehumanizing us in some ways, you know, is the process, de, it, it, and so even in its sound you can, you hear the absence, although if it has to be modernized, if it has to actually be viable in this, in this economy, what, what are the answers? I don't think we have very easy answers. Um, and of course, uh, there really isn't any easy answer. And especially with international laws, borders, and so much hatred, and so much sort of mistrust between people, uh, it's it's very very difficult to know what what the solution might be, um, and so much greed, of course. Um, uh, but this border in in this place, Shella, we had. Uh, I mean, it was not just about this, the absence, uh, you know, the the human sound dying, and uh, in its place, it's being replaced by this completely, you know, a sound that does that doesn't care. You know, it doesn't, a heartless sound almost, you know. But we just didn't have that. In the middle of all that poverty, all that, um, uh, all that fear, because, because these are people who are coming from, um, uh, they, it's still a porous border, despite the fence. It's still people are coming, people. And uh, we've recently had a whole, uh, something called the NRC, which is the National Registration of citizenship in the eastern state of Assam and a whole um, list has been drawn up of uh, who can belong and who cannot belong uh, to the country, who has the legal papers and who doesn't have the papers. Um, uh, so the, these, all of these in all of these places people are kind of live with some fear uh, of, uh, because many of them are actually coming from Bangladesh into India and they are afraid that they might be thrown out because they don't have proper papers. It's like the kind of immigrant crisis that we have in Europe as well, in, in any place, you know, it's, it's the same kind of um, huge problem that um, uh, people are, actually it's part of people's daily struggles. So if you ask them where are you from or when did you come, they will not answer, they'll just um, evade the question. But um, we were there and um, I saw this woman as we were going, I think we were going on one of our field trips and we we're coming out of the guest house. We we're actually staying in the border security force guest, guest house. You know, and so um, we were coming, we were walking up and then I saw this woman um, and uh, I asked her, she smiled at me and she was with a small child, an, elder, an elderly woman. And I said, so uh, she smiled at me and she, I, so I said, where are you? And she did not look like one of the local people, you know, she didn't look like one of the hill tribes or... So um, I said, so where are you from? And she said, um, uh, I'm from Tilmari. Now, Tilmari is a place in North Bengal and, and I, I said, Tilmari, how come you're here? And she said, well, I was married here. And then she said, I said, you know, I know a song about Chilmari. I told her. And she said, really? And I said, OK, I, what do you do? And she said she has a shop in the market. She sells um, and 
pan, beetle leaf and beetle nuts uh, are the are a big thing. So very poor people, if they cannot offer anything to their guests, they'll offer you betel nut. So pan, gua pan, gua is or uh, tambul, uh, that's the betel nut and betel leaf. That's something that they'll offer to their guest. So uh, she says she has a shop where she sells um, betel leaf and betel nut. So then um, we went and then on our way back, I saw her shop. So after about a few hours, I came back and as we were walking back, so I said, okay, now I have to sing you this song. So then I sang her this song, which uh, I actually learned from the field because I met someone in the field. And uh, this is a song that comes from North Bengal where this woman, again, the question of the boatman, the river, but this is now so met not so metaphorical anymore. She's actually really thinking of her real, uh, so she's unhappy in her husband's home. She's leaving her husband. She's going back to her parents. But she's also unhappy in her parents' house because uh, they married her off to this man. So she's unhappy everywhere. And so she's calling the boatman. Here she's not calling him Maji. She's calling him Naiya. So it's a different word that they're using for the same sort of, you know, boatman. And uh, they're saying, so... Um, why aren't you there to take me across the river? But she is really, perhaps this boatman is the man she loves and perhaps she wants to go away with him, you know. So it's not very clear, but she sings this song where... <clears throat> said shingi mari she didn't say chil mari naya re eto bala hol kane noka nai mor khate shuk chorot mor baper bari biyadi chen mok khotok dhore re these songs are really social commentaries. She's really talking about her everyday life. She's talking about how, how her parents, there must have been a bride price. So she was married off to this uh, man who had a wife. So she there was a co-wife and this Shoti Ner Katha Shuni Shadai so uh, she, he listens to the other wife and he comes and beats me up. So why, why did you marry me off? But yet she wants to, she has to go back. Where does she go back? She's leaving him. And she really, it's a very feminist song, you know, she sings from the woman's position, she's saying, me, a woman, you know, I've been so, um, treated so badly in, in life, you know, by my husband, by my parents, by everybody, and so, and look at me, now I'm, I'm so alone. And then she says, so obviously the Naya is the only person who can save her. So Naya, she's calling the boatman. So who might this Naya be? So we can only speculate on the Naya. No, actually the last line was Naya re. So the river's name was Jinjira and she was sitting on the bank of this river Jinjira and she's thinking of actually leaving. So I sang this song to this woman and um, then uh, she, was, she was like beaming, you know, she was so happy. But there were other women there and there was not just her, there was a woman who looked like one of the women we have um, 
we have recorded, um, we uh, started doing um, a project, uh, uh, from our project we started a, a record label um, uh, in 2013 and we call it Travelling Archive Records and we've just brought out three so far and this is the two women here we recorded them over a period of eight years and so we sort of wrote an audio essay based on the recordings that we did and also with references to other sounds and um, uh, I mean listening to them and thinking about someone like Texas Gladden who was recorded by John uh, by Alan Lomax so uh, there's a lot of that kind of or listening to her and thinking about you know what sounds she might have heard when she was growing up and bringing songs from old gramophone into into this soundtrack so that the kind but this woman here Chandra Bhutti uh, Rai Bormun whom um, I met first in 2006 and then um, uh, we ha we went back to her again and again and she came and stayed with us and so it was really a sort of a relationship uh, not just between a researcher and her subject but became much more than that. We called her Mashima. We called both of them Mashima. And so uh, then she has died. She was 74 when we met her and she died uh, eight years later. And she was, uh, she was 74, she was 72. And now she's still alive. She's over 90 now. And she's still this, you know, rock solid sort of archive, living archive um, uh, that, uh, and with her gone again, brings up the question of what can we keep, what when can we keep in an archive, how much can we keep and what goes and the question of sound and time I think comes in. So Chandra Bhutti Mashima whom I um, heard in, um, heard so many times, there was this woman there and she, she actually um, looked so much like Chandra Bhutti Mashima and so clearly I asked her so what is your and she listened to me and she said, oh, you must be a singer, she said, you know. And she said, do you sing for the TV, she asked me. So I said, um, not really, but yes, I do sing. And she said, um, then I asked her, so do, what do you do? Can you sing? Because women of Silet, everybody can sing and dance. Actually, it, the song flows in their blood. So um, I, I thought, um, uh, you know, to, I, I said, I'm sure, Mashima, you know how to sing. And she said, um, she laughed, you know, she was giggling away. She was, she had, again, she reminded me of this woman. Then, uh, and I asked her what her name was, and she said her name was, and this will actually, it's, it's very interesting this, when I tell you what the name is, but it'll probably not work so much as lost in translation. Her name was Shubornurekha, she said, you know, so Shubornurekha is this amazing film by Riti Ghatok, and which is about partition. So, um, and she said her name was Shubornurekha, and Shubornurekha is the name of a river. So, um, uh, this woman was there. So, there's a lot of things that was happening in that border place other than that conveyor belt story. So, um, and we had also heard this story. Uh, there's this gruesome image uh, uh, that I don't know if I, if I should or should not show you, but maybe just let me show you. Just I, let me just show this image. Yeah. yeah. This one, this one. Okay. So this is also the story of the same border. The same border over which the, uh, the uh, limestone goes from one country to another. And a border that this girl, a 15-year-old girl, Felani Khatun, she tried to cross and she was shot. And she lay like that. She, she was like, she stayed like that. And that became an image that sort of, you know, went, it, 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 um, it went viral, of course. And then in 2011, this happened, a 15-year-old girl. So, in reality, this is the fractured land about which I'm talking, you know. So, um, people live in fear, they're afraid to say where they came from, when they came, what name, the, what their name is, what religion um, they belong to. 
they, they live in fear. The fear is, uh, is, is real. Um, I will um, take you uh, to a sound, um, so, uh, which um, ag again comes from uh, this place where I grew up called Shillong. And we, in the, in the 1970s, when I was uh, uh, in school, um, there, was, there have been many, many resistance movements in this place against actually the Bengalis. So the people of Bengal who went with, with, uh, the, with the British to set up offices there. There was one kind of sort of the, uh, the people who went with the administration, with the British administration and went. And of course, the Bengalis were the first sort of, sort of to collaborate with the British. So in, in, for, for those very reasons, they went with the administration to go and work in these places. But at the same time, there, was, um, there, there were these other people who came because of the, sea, because of the porous border. Because between Silet and Shillong, there is no border as such, you know. So people came because from when we went to Chirapunji to see the rains, we actually saw the hills of Silet. We saw the, the mist that covered Chirapunji also um, actually enveloped the hills of Silet. So it was the same mist. And therefore, there was, there's been, uh, there's been uh, um, sort of different... Um, reasons and um, different reasons for people to come into this place called Shillong. And it was a new, new hill town and administration, administrative unit that had been built up, uh, built by the British. So people came. And then, of course, those who felt, uh, the whole, those who were worst affected were the local people, the tribals, uh, the hills, uh, hills people. And after a point when they sort of you know began to assert themselves they began to see not so much the real people who held power as the people who needed to they need needed to fly, uh, sort of resist um, against but uh, they began to see um, anybody that they any group that they could identify as the enemy and they began to feel this need to assert themselves and flush people out. We became, in the 70s, we became kind of, a, uh, also we, we, we suffered for this. But when I look back now, I also see that it was not such a simple thing. The simple uh, answers are not there in this case either. The question is not one of identity, uh, of fixed identities. The question is also one of us not being able to we live in, apparently we live, we live in sort of multilingual, multicultural spaces, but we do not know each other. The problem is one of not wanting to know. The problem is one of imposition of cultures. The problem is one of sort of, you know, um, the, the, the need uh, for assimilation from the outsider. So all of these problems sort of make the problem very complex. The reason I'm giving this background is because of the sound that I'm going to play now, is um, a, a, a song that we also found near Cherapunji, uh, uh, which was in a village called Sohbar, a small, a little village, almost like it's so picturesque, so beautiful. This village was. I thought they'd kind of done it up for somebody, you know, and then it, it just looked so pretty. This village, and um, we went there and. Um, uh, can you help me? I think we just played the um, this video. Yeah. So as we were going into the village, we heard a sound, and then uh, we thought, "What is this sound?" And then we went in, and um, then we saw children in a little room where they were singing and practicing and this is a whole thing that the local people feel now in order to revive all and sort of you know their traditions lost traditions that they're trying to revive and in fact trying to go back to their pre-church times also so more animistic when they were when church hadn't come in when the missionaries so not only had not the sort of the administration not come in also in terms of culture when all this had not come in 
what was it like? So sort of reinventing themselves, they have these song books now, which they give to their children. They have their own flag with a cock um, there, you know, as a rooster there. And so that is their sign, a red flag with a rooster. And, um, um, and these children, they, they have these song books from which they sing. So. <laughs>
So, <laughs> and this, uh, and then this is, um, this is this kind of sound that was there when we were growing up, a sound that we never tried to actually listen to. So we are, we actually grow up in our, in our small worlds of, um, in our own little worlds of listening. And we, we can sometimes, um, we can sometimes, um, we get to hear things which are there around us and sometimes we don't. So uh, it's, uh, the sound travels to us, sometimes we do not travel to the world. We lived side by side. What I'm trying to say is I lived side by side with this sound, but I never heard it till at this late time when I decided, when I made a conscious choice to actually go and listen to the sound of the place in a different way. So there are sounds around us and around all of us that we, we um, they're there, but we never learn to listen, I think. And uh, I think uh, one thing that the last thing that I'll try to uh, share with you is something that also that I've been doing is I've been working with uh, these um, old recordings um, from the archives. Uh, I'm, I'm mainly focusing on uh, recordings made by a Dutch scholar who went to Bengal in the 1920s first and then went, kept going back until the end of the 1950s he would go back and he taught at SOAS as well. And so, and um, um, so um, this, um, this scholar, his name was Arnold Barker, and, um, sorry. Please carry on. I just need to turn down the volume for next door. Okay, sorry. Just request it. Right, please. Is that all right? I'll just, if you keep on going, don't worry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there was, when we were in Shillong, and we used to live in this house, uh, which was on one side of the stream. And there was, a, you know how builders are, they'll never, you give them an appointment, then they'll never come. So there was this, our house was being built and the builder wouldn't um, come. And he would drink, you know, in the daytime. And he was, of course, he was not interested in working. So I was given the task of actually calling out from this end of the, my mother would say, call him, he's there, you can see him there far away. So my voice does do problems, you know, I am a bit too loud, I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> the thing is, uh, I was talking about uh, the, Dutch, uh, the Dutch scholar um, who, who came to Bengal and um, he was, um, uh, he uh, then he recorded he recorded many uh, I mean his uh, talking about his work will take another whole day I'm not talking about that I'm mainly talking about mainly in the in the sense of listening because the material that it's now we're talking about uh, the uh, the materiality of sound so he recorded on wax cylinders and so in the 1930s. So, uh, and when we did an exhibition on um, Anil Barker's work in Shantini Ketan, I wrote uh, something about learning to listen to the wax cylinders and I'll, let me read from this. It is a strange feeling to listen to these wax cylinders. If you listen once, listen again, and slowly the sound grows on you. Physically and materially, time is written on these cylinders. The noise, the hiss of the machine, the cracks and crevices on the body of the <coughs> cylinder all reveal themselves in their sound. At first, you hear little else beside the noise. Beside the noise. Um, then gradually, you hear more. Um, this listening changes not only because you can hear better and can separate the song from the, from the other sounds, like separating grain from chaff, but also because the meaning of grain and chaff have changed in the meantime for you. Because you begin to listen, you understand the meaning of noise as well. You do not read it as noise anymore. You don't listen to it as noise anymore. You, um, 
You know, uh, you now know something about the machine, the details of the cans which Barker was uh, sending to Berlin, the woman he was recording in Noga. You, your listening changes also because you are more familiar with the story of the song. You know more about the time, something about the genre, the composer. Hence, when Chitralekha Chaudhary says she was taught by Shanti Dev Ghosh, you hear the shadows of her teacher in her voice. Although the particular recording in question was not a cylinder, but recorded on a real, uh, anyway, this was a reel-to-reel -reel recording. Um, or, or when you have heard the Moina Dal Kirtonias uh, sing for us, then on the shop on Yom Sheba songs, and you listen to a recording from the archives marked Kenduli on their catalog, then you think, this cannot be Kenduli. Perhaps this was Moinadal, and maybe a team, or maybe a team from Moinadal was singing at Kenduli. So you begin to actually learn as you listen more, you begin to, you, 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 you learn, you, you can, you almost, you can, you build a discernment, actually, and uh, and 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 uh, and an acuteness for hearing, and not just an acuteness for hearing, but an acute perception. And uh, uh, that perception is what is most important, I think. Here, it's not just about developing your skills as as a listener, but what do you listen to? Are you listening just to that sound? Or are you listening to that space? Are you listening to history? What are you listening to? So, um, I think. We'll end with this question. I, I, it, there's no point me now playing more recordings because there's so much, you know. But if you would like to ask some questions, and um, I think that for me is, I'm so interested in the wax cylinder recordings of Barker because for me there are layers of sound. As I listen, as I listen, I hear Barker's recordings in them. As I take them back to the field, I hear this time written on Barker's recordings, his recordings written on this time. As I learn songs from that time, from that, from Barker's recordings, or from the recordings we make because we've taken Barker's recordings back to the field, as I listen to those and I start to sing my own, uh, uh, my own uh, response to, to the recordings of Arnold Barker, then another layer of time gets kind of uh, placed on, on these already multiple layers of time and um, memory, I think. Thank you. Okay. We won't play. Uh, we don't want to play. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Uh, questions? And if you could wait for the microphone, please, because we're recording this. <clears throat> This is a bit more of a musical question. I was wondering if you could speak about the, uh, the songs from the feminine perspective that you were, you were speaking about and how they, maybe they played in your life. The, Sorry, I, I, it's, can you repeat that? The feminine songs that you mentioned earlier. Uh, yeah. When you met the woman yeah. who was singing. I was just wondering if you could speak on those in your own life. Well, I think. Uh, in the first place, being a woman and writing my own songs, um, uh, it's not just uh, the woman's songs in terms of context or, or subject, you know, uh, matter, like the content of the song. But it's also just the woman as the singer, the woman as the performer. Uh, all of this has actually um, had an impact on my life, I think. And uh, I. As I've been more, I mean, I've become more aware about my own self as well as I've, as I've met more people in the field, I think that has happened. And um, I'll just give you a small example. Uh, this woman, the woman whose photograph I was showing you on this album cover, so her name is Chandra Bhuti. And, you know, we grew up in our Bengali homes as like good middle class. Girls, you know, we learned our song. If you had a voice, you went to and learned. You had music lessons, you learned the songs. But you also learned something about how you sat, how you presented yourself, how you sang, how you did not actually express your song as a, as a, 
as a, uh, in its physicality almost, you know. You kind of actually, you took out, you, 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 um, you were conscious, you were carefully taught how, what your gesture should be, what your posture should be, all these things were taught to you. Then I meet this 72-year-old woman who is very conventional. She's a widow, she wears white, she j has just has a very domestic life, five, six children. And she, she told me all kinds of very interesting stories about how her house was getting filled up with children. And then she decided, I can't have any more children anymore. This is too much. You know, my house is going to be filled with children. So she went on her own. She went and got some, something done to her. She didn't tell her husband. Whether she told her husband or not, we don't know. Because when I asked, did your husband know, she said, she, for every answer that was critical to her, she would say, um, She'd say, you know, I have tremendous, uh, not just enthusiasm, but I have tremendous, in, in this case, sort of, you know, I love to live. But almost like that, you know, that's her answer to most of her questions. So if you meet a woman like that, and then she's, she's singing a song of love and devotion, but she sings with her body. And you see her, the 72-year-old woman, clad in a sari, covered, head covered. And here she's singing, she sings this song. Amar Krishna pe paashaye jaye jaye prano jaye dharo go Amar re dharo shoy go dharo go Amar re dharo So when she's singing like that, you know, she's building the dance into her body. And uh, this uh, might be a song written by a man, but this becomes a woman's song for me. This becomes my song as I try to sing it like her. Firstly, you know. thank you for a really in-depth description of your work and the thank song you. is beautiful as well. Um, I wanted to segue back to the beginning of your discussion about the landscape and the soundscape that you are amongst, and how the songs of the lowlands in Bangladesh are like, um, uh, they represent the sound of the river. And I was wondering if there are any more examples of the Bengali and Northeast Indian landscape that permeates into either the language or other sound cultures. Yeah, uh, actually, you see, even when it comes to the river songs, there are many kinds of river songs. In fact, the, the first song that you heard of when the boat was being built, that is also a river song. And that is, so you have the uh, Sharigan, which is when, so the, the songs that are interesting, because the, it, it's really a song to do with the ebb and flow of the sort of, you know, so when, when you have, when you are aided by the wind, and the, you, you're flowing with this, uh, you're going with the flow, then you have more energy, all right? So you can let your songs loose, you know, so you can begin to reflect on love, on loss, and you have these long, mournful songs, you know, like, Dehuturi, Dilam Chariyo. So, you have I let loose my the uh, the the vessel of my the my bo the my body vessel you know so in the name of you guru so and if I do make any mistakes it's your fault that's what the song is now that kind of song you can sing it because you have the luxury of of the wind to sing that kind of song but there's the other song which is more like a work song that they were singing you know. So you can imagine that they are actually rowing and they're rowing against the stream. And so they need, and it's a group song, so they need to build that kind of, so even in the case of the river song, the topography or, or the, the, the environment is kind of, the environmental condition is written into the song. Then of course, because Bengal is very vast, and the, the, the landscape is not just of rivers. There's the very dry parts of Bengal, 
very, very dry parts. And from those regions, even the, the quality of the voice is very different. It's uh, the, 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 um, if, if you start kind of doing a landscape of, of with, with the voice, then you'll find a very different kind of, you, the topography is written in the voice. It's a dry voice that's kind of screeching, that, that is kind of almost crying for what? Love, which is actually rain as if, you know, so it's, it's that kind of a voice that comes out of that land. And so the songs are, of course, of maybe the themes are the same, because what are people? What do we sing about across the world? We sing about love, we sing about loss, we sing about desire. Those are the things we sing about home, about wars. Those are the main things don't we sing about, don't we? Apart from the very topical things which are very specific to each place. But other than that, there are the general Generally speaking, we sing about a certain universal ideas and themes. So they might be singing that same song again of, of you know, be take, being ta taken across the river of life. But that song will sound so different because it's coming from that space. It will become a different song. And of course, the ideas of, of, of drought and water. So um, a song like, um, from the western end of, of West Bengal, which touches Bihar uh, or Jharkhand, uh, those areas, it, it will sound very different from how the song in the eastern end is. So, uh, and even the words might be different, you know. So, I met a woman, again a woman here, a woman who was, uh, again, she comes from this community of sort of, you know, the, the courtesans, the sing, and not so much the courtesans really, they are the more the, I don't know, Nachni, how to explain, and uh, they're, they're, the, they're an outcast community, you know, they're, they're the performers, but these women, they, are, they have a man in their life, but the man uh, has a family, but she is, she, is, she is the other woman, she is the mistress, but she's the performer and the mistress, and so, um, she can't have children. I mean, so her life is really extremely painful. But at the same time, she is so drawn to the art. They say that uh, they're just drawn to music in such a way that they leave their home. But often it's not just that. They're sometimes abandoned women. Sometimes they are women who have no place to go. So they go into music, you know, a life of music and performance. So she, I asked her to sing a ritual song of harvesting. And the way she sang it, I really can't sing it like her, but the song was this. I don't know if I can carry this, but it, there's a there's a certain angst in that voice, you know, that uh, if you hear her, you will know. You you almost see the voice sort of you know shredding as if you can see as if the fibers you can see, you can almost visualize the voice. Mm. Thank you. <coughs> I was wondering about, uh, in an area that large and populous, there must, are there small scale languages that are also dying out? Yeah, there's, uh, there are so many languages which, I mean, I think even Bengali will die out soon, or the kind of Bengali, because there's the whole thing of, you see, it's, it's so <laughs> complex, so many languages. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, with uh, a lot of sort of identity movements, languages are also being revived. So there is also the whole thing of languages almost having died out. And so it's almost after the death, there is, a, a, there is a, an attempt to bring it back to life. Or it's almost on the verge of death. So those kinds of things are there. Um, India is anyway a land of so many languages. 
if you think of Bangladesh, Bangladesh, which was born on the on the on the whole question of language, because Urdu was being imposed on them in 1952. They had their language movement, and gradually that became their nationalist movement. But what happened as a result was that other languages, Bengali became the dominant language, but the other languages actually have lost their place and they, they do not have a voice. So the, the politics of language is very much there in each of these places, in small places, tiny places with their own language. Even within them, they have their differences. I mean, I'm no expert to talk about these things. but. Um, for example, the the song that I sang of um, of the uh, Naya, the song, the woman, like which I sang in the border for this woman. Um, this song is in a language. It, it 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 is not exactly Bengali. Actually, it's an in between language between Bengali and Assamese, and uh, so and then of course the local people have a certain claim to that language. There's a lot of politics around that language and real serious politics. People kill each other for it, you know. So um, that kind of, and then they don't like the idea of others appropriating that language. Language, if you also, if you are doing projects or if you're bringing, if you, if you are, if you are having, if you have a, a department, a faculty, or whatever, you know, that's dealing with endangered languages, languages under threat, then of course there is also sometimes for tokenism there needs to be, there will be money that will come in, so then people will also try to fish in that pond, and then, you know, then again there'll be, so it's, it's a very complex issue, you know, within, even within our work, that's why we say Bengal is not a lang land of just the Bengalis. So language-wise also, it's not just Bengali music that you hear. And uh, Urdu uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a living language of Bengal. And now there is so much that's going on where they're trying to say, you know, why Urdu? But at the same time, the Hindi is being imposed on the people of all over India. You know, or, so we have to, and so the language, we are also seeing the changes in the language, you know, so Bengali is become, becoming more Hindiized, also a kind of Hindi is being imposed on us, uh, so it's, it's too much. I, I wonder too, because I know in a lot of uh, places in the world there's uh, sort of active suppression of, of yeah. small scale languages, it's yeah. happened in, uh, yeah. in, with Welsh, in yeah, Welsh yeah. Here, it's happened with indigenous yeah. languages in Canada, people Sent to residential schools yeah, I'm. I was working and I was working before coming. I mean, when I first came, this time when I came, I first went to work with a Welsh poet, and so yeah, we would. I was hearing a lot about those things when I was meeting the family, and I I really wanted to know about uh, more about uh, language. And did you have people telling you stories about um, being punished or? actively discouraged from speaking languages other than what was sort of seen as the national language? Or? Well, uh, actively, if, whether being punished or not, if it's a socially, if it is more, you see, you can only read certain places if you only speak a certain language. So it's whether you, the punishment is of a different kind. <laughs> You see, the punishment is there. It's written into the system. So if you, if you use your language, you won't get to places. So for us, if we, we are best placed if we speak English. So for us, uh, actually, even now, it, it, I mean, uh, it's not even not, not a question of the Indian languages. For us, after 70 years, uh, it, the best language to know, the, the language of power to know is is uh, English, but within Bengali also say things things like dialects, the literal language, the that the literary language, the and and the the dialects. There's a lot of politics also between East Bengal and West Bengal. The language that dominated always is the language of Calcutta, the big centre. So 
and when Bangladesh became an independent and the whole uh, state and the whole thing has been about Bangladesh needing to actually claim its own place in language and its own language, a place for its own language. But Bangladesh is also not one language. So then Dhaka begins to dominate because that's the, that's the center. And then the other languages kind of lose out. Here you'll see Sileti saying that we are not even Bengali. We are a different language. They have their own script. You know, at the same time, there's so you if if you have to fill in this column, you know, Asian, then what? Tick the boxes. Then are you Sileti or are you Indian or Bengali or whatever? You know, so Sileti becomes marked as a different language, while all the many of the songs that I sang now are in Sileti. You know, so uh, all of those things. Which is the language that? of power, which is the language that gives us power, uh, is a complicated question, <laughs> no easy answer. Uh, any other questions? I, I have others, but I want to give people an opportunity to ask. Isn't that more the, the practice, uh, pr the research leading to practice, I think. That's more about that. That's the second part of the work. It's not so much practice leading to research, but the, this is more about research leading to practice, where you begin, it's a, it's, that is the stage of interpretation, I think, where you have seen things, and you have heard things, and then you begin to put them together. In your, your, in your mind. You've been to many places, not necessarily bringing the sound of this particular place to this particular image, but you are, um, you, you are thinking that this place probably sounds like that sound, you know, and so it's, it's how you visualize a sound, how you imagine, um, um, uh, how you imagine, uh, how you visualize a sound and how you sound an image, you know, I think it's both. I think that's, that's the phase, that's the stage where we work, we move from being just researchers to also being artists, I think. Yeah, I, I think the other interesting thing that you said was something about recording the sound of history. Yeah. And, you know, I see that in the sort of scratches on the film. Mm. stretch around the whole country it's like I mean what is how, how does that actually work in practicality because it's you know it's very, it is a really powerful image and I think it's yeah. center to everything we've been talking about today. well uh, border depending on uh, India is actually um, not the border with Bangladesh is on the east but uh, then but that is not just the border with Bangladesh there's also border with uh, with uh, Bhutan there's a border with um, with Tibet, and uh, there's a border with Burma. So all these borders are there. Uh, so and uh, so as you actually move towards the northeast of 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 Bengal, uh, you move more towards the southeast of southeastern Asia. So you're moving further away from South Asia, as such which is where India seems to fall and then becomes more southeastern. Even in its sound, even in, its, in the way it looks, how the people are, how they dress, 
in what they make, what food they eat, and all of that, you know, it becomes more and more gradually, it becomes more and more southeastern, I think. So uh, the problem of border, but we, the major problem of border for us is the border problem which comes from partition. I think that is the big problem that we have to actually, really, because the problem of border with Nepal is not such a big problem. It is not, because with Nepal, we don't have that kind of a historical um, uh, sort, sort of conflict, you know, a, a history of conflict as we have with Bangladesh and with Pakistan. So those are the two places from where, with, where the border problem, the border, the, so the borders along those places become the more critical borders. And our work happens to be along those borders. So um, a border story which is very interesting, I don't know if, do you have time for it? Um, yeah. yeah. So I'll, there's a, one of the things that, one of the books that we, oh, I was talking about Delwar Hussain's book, another book that we worked with in order to sound that book was um, a book by a young journalist, uh, actually a student from Pakistan, from West Pakistan, who was studying in East Pakistan at the time when the 1971 War of Liberation started. So he was 20, 21 years old. He was, uh, he was studying physics at Dhaka University. And then war broke out. He was an Urdu speaker. Again, the whole language question now comes in. Ur Urdu speaker. So now uh, the problem was this, that um, he was, of course, his life was under threat now because there was this war that was going on. In, in, in some ways, it was also a civil war because it was a war within the country. Uh, but uh, uh, the eastern part of Pakistan was trying to break itself free from uh, the West. So at this time, um, this young boy, he was staying with the Bengalis and he was, um, he was, um, uh, and he was sheltered by a Bengali family till he could go back home. Uh, so, and then he was keeping a diary. And then his son now, who's, who's a student at Chicago, uh, a student of comparative literature, he, uh, we met him and we heard about this book that his father had written, which later came out as he did not, he, he abandoned physics, he became a journalist, his father, and later this book came out, which the book was called Padma Surk Hai, which means uh, Padma the river, the, it's mighty river. Um, uh, so Padma's, uh, Padma turns red. So it's written at that time of, you know, about fear, about... And so a lot, what happened at this time was refugees from the war were having to cross the border, which is this new, newly erected border. So but in 1947, a border that's come up. In around 1970, they're having to cross it and come to India, which is a place they see as their enemy. So, and yet they're having to come to India for shelter because the Pakistani army is completely sort of butchering them. So how do you deal with that? So he was writing about this whole thing. He's coming with this family for shelter, crossing the border, coming to this side. And he's writing, it's awful, horrible to think that I'm having to cross this border now, you know, and that I'm having to go to this enemy state and then I'm having to, you know, go to them. For um, uh, and that kind of sort of uh, total loss of trust and you know this actual a, a kind of fortressing that's going on now even more. So and within that climate we are trying to work. It's it's very com complicated, you know, to do that. And this person wrote a very beautiful thing in his. No, in his memoirs, he wrote, suffer, suffer, suffer. Suffer is the, uh, is the only thing that we can do. Suffer meaning um, uh, travel. Suffer, S-A-F-A-R, you know, suffer. And I somehow would like to also read it as suffer, suffer, suffer. You know, if we suffer more without suffering, I think there's no deliverance for us. <laughs> Yeah. At some point, you, you alluded to the, the problems of, um, of, of how 
how much you can keep in your archive. Um, uh, and I wonder if you could say a bit more about that, this, this question, you know, what you decide to um, collect and, and how serendipitous it is and how much it's a kind of, you know, it's actually a process of, of conscious collection because there are things that you really feel you must have. And, and where do you draw the line? How do you draw the line? <laughs> There's no answer to this. <laughs> the question is one of, I think, when it started, it started sort of, you start from really a point, you know, it's almost like you start from just this point here, you know, where 15, 16 years ago when you started to sort of make the first recordings. And then it started to grow. And it grew, but at the same time, the, po the thing about the traveling archive is this, that we haven't really expanded over a whole region. What we've done is, again, like I was saying, these women, we recorded them for eight years or ten years. I keep recording her, even now. This time I'll go next month, I'll go to meet the, the other woman who's still around, and I'll record her again. So it's almost often like we're just focusing on these few voices, and we trying to go down deep, you know, more plunging into them, the voices, and that becomes a plunge into time. Instead of sort of spreading out like that, spreading out is impossible. And because we are not really, we didn't set out to be archivists, and that was not the idea at all. Uh, I would rather go back to the same place again and again, and. Um, that is what is in my nature also to do that. Uh, but, and also in spite of that, what do we collect so much that is still, that's already been recorded? What do we do with them? What do we keep? What do we show? What do we not show? Um, I think that again is, again becomes a question of time. Uh, in the sense, today the stories that I'm telling you are very important to me, especially in this time, in this political time, I feel it's very important to talk about, because John had given me sort of a free a freedom to kind of decide, you know, what, what you decide what you want to say. And I felt this is the kind of story I wanted to tell, and which would also work with a, a people who do not come from my place, but would understand because there are universal problems that we're talking about, situations we're talking about, human conditions that we're talking about that. So it depends, you know, what I keep, where I keep what, what I show when, what I do not show. So, and uh, I think that's how, I, and so much will not be done anyway, I think. <laughs> we just end up doing only a few things. I was wondering if you run into, because I, I did some recordings in Botswana once, and one of the people that I recorded was very involved in, in the political sphere. And mm. when I went to show that work at the National Museum there, they got very nervous because their funding came from government and he was being very critical of government. I'm just wondering if you run into, beyond sort of the, the smaller scale things of border guards and, and security guards and things like that, if there's been any official kind of resistance to any of your materials or your work in general? The, um, the answer to this is this, that um, especially um, in both uh, um, India and in Bangladesh, I am mainly friends with people who are very much out of the establishment, outside the establishment. And um, often on the far left side of things, you know, I'm friends with such people, people who are very active in political movement. Um, uh, so, and things are becoming really, really difficult now with the sort of, you know, uh, silencing of voices. Uh, which are, are of critical voices. To be honest, I have to be very strategic because I don't want to lose my ground where I can work. Because my work is my resistance. My work is my protest and I don't want to get involved and I'll show that which will work. I'm not, maybe I'm not being safe, 
But what I'm trying to be is um, is um, is careful. I mean, I'm trying to be. I'm trying to protect the work. So um, I don't know what will happen in the future. Things are going very bad now. For example, we've been protesting against the the arrest of this photographer Shahidul Alam, who has now been in jail for having uh, taken photographs of protesting students on the streets of Dhaka. Now, Shahidul is a friend, and his his partner. They're they're all friends of mine, so I have publicly sort of protested. And it's not a question of taking just the traveling archive work. My, in my case, I'm not very different from my work. So my work and me, there's, it's difficult for me also to disentangle the two. So when I am there, my work is there. So, and I've, I have been part of these um, uh, protests. or I, ha I still have a visa, for a, which was a year, old, a year long. I had one year multiple entry visa. I'm truly not sure what will happen next time whether I'm going to run into problems. But we have to be careful. I think if we want to carry on working, because things are not going to, we're not going to have this big revolution tomorrow where, you know, and then our whole new dawn will uh, come. Nothing like that will happen. We're going to live under even greater suppression. Within that, how to keep working is very important. So uh, in some places, we will not show certain things. In some places, we will say, we will be sub we will subvert the system more than you know go all out uh, so i think uh, that is so far it's worked for me i have an advantage because i'm a singer and some of my songs are fairly well known uh, so i have uh, i've i've been lucky with the access i've got, had so far mm, but i don't know for how much longer it will it will last right well if there's no other uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you so much. Impressed a lot. Thank you. Uh, and the question is: um, uh, Do you record more um, uh, human stories, informal stories, and do you collect them and preserve some? Yeah. We. Um, the thing is, we don't only record songs. The way the recordings are done, and um, often. It, and now there's again a change also coming on, coming in in the work of the traveling archive. Uh, the the we just record a whole session maybe, where the song and the story come together. So stories of people and because we record people uh, the song as part of their peop of people's lives, so the story is very much there. You know they're not necessary. They'll, and they'll talk. And often in, in many of these places, you know, it's a question of the way they talk. It's like they'll tell you, they talk in sort of, um, you know, it, it's, there's a folkloristic quality about the way they'll talk about everyday life. So um, there the story begins to form as they're telling a story about their everyday life, about their daily life even. So uh, the story is very much there. Now, a lot uh, of the recordings that are happening, that have been ha happening, I've, I have personally gone with my little recorder and done recordings. I've been rec making some recordings in the Sundarbans Delta, for example, where you probably know that this is the place of the mangrove forest and where the tigers are, etc. It's a protected area. And uh, in these places I've been going for the last few months, I just have long, long conversations with people. Nothing. Just talk to them. There's no song there, perhaps. You know, I, I, and sometimes I also try to then, that's the thing about language. I try to, I find that a piece of, you know, a speech is so, it's like music to me. And there are, there is bits of that, that when I am interpreting maybe, or bringing that into my work, I might just actually not bring a song in, but I'll just actually play a, a, a speech, a, a part of a speech, and then, you know, use that in my own work. So um, the, the story, separately to ask people for stories, um, sometimes, yeah, when they're talk, singing, say, narrative songs, or mythological songs, then they'll also tell you the story as they are singing. 
that kind of thing happens where it's just a story. But otherwise, it's often a story about life that they'll tell you. Mm. OK, I think we should stop there. And thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.